great to see such a, an audience. Welcome, everybody, um, to a very special event. Um, we've actually made the, the papers first thing this morning. Um, but I'm absolutely design, delighted that the uh, Chancellor and uh, Bill Gates have decided to make the announcement here at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, we are the oldest school of tropical medicine in the world. Um, and we like to think that we're really keeping up with the time. So although we're old, um, we're still at the cutting edge um, of what is moving forward with uh, tropical diseases. And today's announcement, I think, is important for us and for the region. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Tulip, who's going to moderate um, on from here. But thank you very much for all coming. Thank you. And good morning. Um, the two men we have here today, they share a common goal, and that is to wipe out malaria in every country forever. Uh, the UK pledged £1 billion towards that goal, as well as fighting other diseases back in November, and I believe there are some more announcements happening today. But how does that hard cash translate into success? I'll start with you, George Osborne. Why, why this much cash? Why now? And why malaria? Well, first of all, it's great to be here in the, this, uh, this brilliant uh, medical school and to be here not just with Bill Gates, one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our, of our lifetime, but also someone who's made such a massive contribution to tackling disease and poverty, but also my colleague uh, Justine Greening, and who joins me in the Cabinet as the um, Secretary of State for International Development. And look, as in this room are British taxpayers, and you contribute to our international aid effort, and we try to make sure that that money goes towards tackling real problems out there that save lives and create a safer world for Britain. And malaria is a huge killer out there, uh, but with effort and the kind of research that happens here in, in the north of England, we can actually, I think, eliminate this disease, just as we are close to eliminating polio, in part due to the incredible work that Bill has done with his foundation. And so we're committing this money, 500 million pounds a year, uh, with money coming from the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, working with the great doctors and scientists here in Liverpool and elsewhere in the world to bring an end to this disease that causes such heartbreak to so many families in the world, but also a disease which, um, of course, also damages the economies of so many countries. So it's a big commitment. I think it's also this, this I want to sort of leave you with this point, which is these problems are dealable with. I think sometimes there's a sense the problems are impossible. There are so many diseases out there, so many people who are poor, so many people who go hungry. It's not possible to solve these problems. I think what we are proving uh, as a country that almost alone in the world makes this big commitment to spend 0.7% of our national income on, on development is that we can solve these problems and we can solve them in, problem, in partnership with some of the best scientists in the world who are here at the Tropical Medicine School and with uh, great uh, private sector partners like uh, Bill Gates. And Bill Gates, you've, you've said in the past that you're an optimist, that um, you believe that malaria can be eradicated by 2040, and yet we hear those stats, you know, one child dies of malaria every minute. How, how are those two things possible? What, what gives you hope? How, how do you end malaria using this cash? Well, the malaria story is a fascinating one. It's been one of the biggest killers throughout history. And uh, actually, if you look at the human genome, you can see all sorts of ways humans have tried to avoid uh, malaria death. And it really holds back a lot of countries, particularly in Africa. Um, We've had setbacks in malaria where we had a, a good drug like Quarklin, then we got resistance and the deaths went up. Uh, deaths were as high as, as 2 million a year, uh, so having them down at 600,000 a year, which is an awful thing, it's a, an amazing piece of progress. We've had this over 60% reduction by using bed nets. And one of the, actually the biggest project that our foundation supports here in Liverpool is coming up with new chemicals to go into those bed nets that the mosquitoes are not resistant to. So they have this whole pipeline. We did the review this morning of the partnerships and the science and the regulatory steps uh, to make sure we get three new novel compounds so those bed nets uh, will continue to do their job. The bed nets 
have cut the deaths a lot, uh, we'll have to have drugs and vaccines and other things to do these eradications. So what we're going to do is take region by region, uh, starting sort of from the south and north, uh, the final area that we'll go after uh, will be equatorial Africa, where you have year-round malaria. It's very, very tough. But we'll build a lot of knowledge and confidence through these regional activities. So Southeast Asia is one that uh, the UK and our foundation, with a lot of partners in that region, particularly Australia, are committing to do the eradication there. Uh, we're working in southern Africa, moving the malaria border up so that Mozambique and Zambia become malaria-free. Uh, and so project by project, uh, that malaria map will shrink and shrink and shrink. Uh, we did get a consensus uh, that we announced in the fall uh, that this, uh, we should be able to complete it all by 2040. A little bit as we're doing each of those regions, we'll see what's easy and what's hard. You know, personally, I hope we can beat that date. Uh, there's some skeptics who think that that date will be tough. But absolutely, this is an eradicable disease uh, by taking the best of science, uh, which uh, Liverpool's a, a great example of that, doing the kind of modeling to understand the interventions. Eventually, we'll take those uh, 600,000 deaths a year and, and get that to be absolutely zero. And as you said, I mean, clearly a lot of money coming from the UK, around 2.5 billion of it from the UK and, and the rest from the Gates Foundation over a period of time. What is that the right way to be spending British taxpayers' money? Because, of course, there are going to be those that say, you, you know, you're making cuts here in the UK. Why are you spending this amount of cash outside? Well, you know, I think uh, two events in the last year or so have, I think, shown to the British people the value of the commitment we made to tackling these big international problems and really show us that we are not immune to what goes on in the world. And the more we try and shape and improve the world, the better things will be for Britain. Those two events were, first of all, the Ebola uh, outbreak in West Africa, which you, of course, reported on very courageously. Uh, and the second has been the Syrian refugee crisis. Yet in both cases, uh, if we had left Ebola unchecked, you know, it would now be overwhelming, potentially, Europe and causing us all sorts of challenges here at home. Uh, equally, with the Syrian refugee crisis, if you can't provide support to children and families in the camps in places like Lebanon and Jordan, then of course, like uh, anyone's family would, they pick up sticks and they want to move for a better life. So in both those cases, I think British aid is helping to not just improve our world, but actually support Britain's national interest. And it's overwhelmingly in Britain's national interest that a killer disease like malaria is eradicated from this world. A, because actually there are several thousand Britons who get the disease every year, but B, because if uh, economies on our doorstep in Africa are stronger because they're not having to spend huge sums of money dealing with uh, malaria cases, if families in those countries aren't having to tackle malaria in their own family, then they are contributing to their economy, they're becoming stronger, they're stronger countries with more security, they have uh, fewer refugees and fewer people, economic migrants leaving those countries. And that's all a good thing for Britain because we're part of a more prosperous world. And uh, look, of course, this has been you know, uh, an argument and a battle that has gone on in our country. But I'm enormously proud to be part of a government with Justine that has not only made a commitment uh, to uh, spend 0.7% of our national income on aid, but delivered on that. <coughs> And uh, in fact, they, I will end by saying this, the origins of my interest in eradicating malaria and making the commitment on 0.7% are linked uh, because um, about seven or eight years ago, I went with a famous uh, economist, Jeff Sachs, to Uganda uh, and went with him to see what was being done there in the early stages of this commitment to eradicate malaria. Uh, there and then I made the commitment that Britain would help if. Uh, if we got into government, we got into government, we provided that support, and the deaths have measurably fallen. And uh, so uh, I think it's a really good example of thinking smartly about our world and how Britain can shape that world and have an impact on it in a way that helps British people here at home. You talk about uh, allowing Africa, these worst affected countries in Africa, to be prosperous by supporting them. How is this money going to help people in country, help build that expertise, the labs, et cetera, that's needed in these worst affected countries? 
Well, the science here is a mix of the great researchers uh, who are mostly in the US and the UK, and then you, you get these new innovations and you take them out uh, to the country. It's hard to overstate how impactful malaria is. Uh, you simply can't really build a prosperous economy when you have lots of malaria. And one thing that's amazing about these countries is that because they have these very high childhood death rates, uh, that causes families to have lots and lots of kids just to make sure enough survive to adulthood so that they can be supported. So amazingly, as you improve health, you think, okay, you're saving lives, therefore you must be increasing the population growth. In fact, improving health is the best thing you can do to get the population growth to plateau off, which makes everything they need to do, feeding the kids, educating the kids, having enough job for the kids. The real stability comes when you get this magic combination of good health, reasonable education, and then the economic growth that comes behind that. And then, you know, these countries, all of them, the intent is that they become, uh, first, go from being a low income to low middle income, and eventually completely self-sufficient. So as we think about this, these are investments in these countries uh, uh, that will reduce the instability, uh, cause their economies to be better partners, uh, and it's great to go out and see this work on the ground. I actually went and saw these new bed nets and how they work with the local community to make sure it's in the acceptable form that people want to sleep under them and then actually have lots and lots of huts that they're trying out the work, uh, which the scientists here are actually coming up with the, the compounds. There's obviously commitment here to end malaria. What about commitment in the worst affected countries? Because you know, as, as you very well know, you go to some of these places there aren't roads, there aren't the health centers nearby. In terms of getting the right drugs to the right people, it's really challenging. And unless there's that commitment from the worst affected countries themselves, then all of this becomes much more tricky. Yeah, one group that's been super is called the African Leaders uh, for, for Malaria, uh, ALMA. Uh, President Kikwete of Tanzania headed that up. But all the leaders were very engaged in this. You know, if you're in a malarious region, it is the disease that people are the most uh, interested in getting rid of. I mean, it's awful to have your kid sitting there with cerebral malaria. And it's not just the kids who die. Even the kids who survive, uh, there's a lot of them that have been permanently affected. You know, your brain, uh, as you have that, that very high fever, it can be permanently damaging. So just to, ha to realize their potential, uh, you know, to have a better economy eventually in some of these places, even to have tourism, which is tough when you've got malaria, uh, they, they are very engaged. Uh, and in fact, each of these groups talk to the local governments about how much of their budget they can afford to put into the malaria. And so they, they have skin in the game. They're a real partner. Even a country as poor as, say, Ethiopia is very anxious to put some of their money against uh, malaria eradication. Is this all part of the big, bigger picture of lessons learned from Ebola? There's a report out today from the Science and Technology Committee saying that Britain was slow, um, that it's not prepared to uh, make vaccines quickly should an epidemic hit here. Is this part of those lessons learned? There's obviously been a lot of soul searching uh, in the international community since Ebola hit. Well, look, I think Britain, um, frankly, can be very proud of the role it, role it played. Uh, you know, we moved with the United States. Uh, we moved in Sierra Leone, uh, and it was a massive British effort, not just from our aid budget, from our, but from our military too. Uh, for a period, it was Britain's largest overseas military deployment. And so when you think of your military, you often think of them fighting in places like Afghanistan. There they were fighting disease in Sierra Leone, and I think we can be very proud as a country. And it, I think it rather demonstrates this point, which is you can have your military budget, and we're increasing that. You can have your aid budget, we're increasing that. Put them together, and Britain can really make a difference in the world. I think the lessons learned, and you know that is it is being done, is is the I think the kind of international coordination to begin with what the World Health Organization did early on. You know, it did take a while, I think, for the world to wake up both to the scale of the epidemic and to the logistical challenge required. And in the end, my impression is, but you know, I defer to people like yourself who were out there reporting on it, that the, the, what we had to do to solve it was in the end, it was like, okay, Britain's gonna take on Sierra Leone and, 
Uh, you know, America's going to take on a, a neighboring country and we're going to go in and just sort the problem out. And I think, you, you know, maybe there are lessons to be learned about the way some of the multilateral organizations uh, kind of handled what was, to be fair, uh, you know, a really challenging situation. What would you say, Phil, is, is the most exciting innovation that, that you've seen that you think, okay, this is going to really get us out of the malaria problem? This is, this is how we're going to end it. Well, the malaria isn't going to be just one tool. Uh, bed nets have gotten the death rates down. But even if we had perfect use of bed nets, we wouldn't get the eradication because you've got mosquitoes indoors, you've got mosquitoes outdoors as well. Uh, we have drugs coming along. Uh, there's a, a GSK drug uh, that works against a type of malaria known as Vibax. It's absolutely fantastic. You take the pill once and not only are you cured with that single dose, but also your uh, blood is cleared so that when the mosquito bites you, it's not transmitting it to other people. A lot of the malaria drugs we've had, you have to take over three days and you're still a source when the mosquito bites you of uh, potentially infecting other people. So these uh, better drugs are going to be part of the picture. Uh, we're using computer models now. Uh, Imperial College and others are very good at this, where you look at the various interventions and say, OK, if we go in in the low season, where very few people are carrying the parasite in their blood, and we test people, uh, one of the techniques will be called uh, mass drug administration, where in the low season, you get uh, basically everybody to take the drug so they're cleared and then there's not much parasite when the, the, a lot of the mosquitoes come back during the high season. Uh, and so the best minds in science are, are being pulled into this. Uh, there's about five different British universities, there's tons of companies, uh, there's lots of field trials uh, that go with this. So it'll be fairly complex. But we're already seeing in the, the South Africa and the Southeast Asia effort uh, that when you get those, those groups working together, that the map pretty quickly, uh, malaria goes away. In your lifetime, hopefully. Oh, absolutely. We'll, we'll get malaria in my lifetime, assuming I, I live uh, a reasonable <laughs> period of time. Uh, we're, we're in good shape on that one. OK, well, Bill Gates, George Osborne, thank you very much. I think we've got time for a few questions uh, from the audience. So let's start with this gentleman here. If you could just say who you are and your question. Uh, Alistair Cray, Principal School of Tropical Medicine. Um, as a malaria researcher, I'd be delighted to hear a lot about malaria, but the fund is also funding other areas, and executive tropical diseases is something we really like at the local school. Would you like to expand a bit on what you want yeah. to see happening in that area as well? Well, I'm someone who's actually had dengue fever, so I have a <laughs> personal interest in that. <laughs> In, in what we could do to tackle all sorts of um, diseases, and particularly, I think some of the um, uh, some of the rare diseases that you talk about. So the Ross Fund. I mean, I'm sure many of you will know who uh, Sir Ronald Ross was, but not everyone will know. He he won the Nobel Prize. He he worked here at the Liverpool School, and uh, he was the first person I think to identify the mosquito as a key agent in the uh, transmission of malaria. Uh, that Ross Fund is not just a fund that the British government is contributing to to tackle malaria. It's also going to have, uh, I think, around £200 million in it to help with some rare diseases that don't get the kind of attention that malaria does. I, I should say this as well. That as well as being out there doing good in the world, creating a stronger world, saving lives, this money that we provide is also, I hope, a huge boost for science in Britain, uh, and uh, particularly science here in the north of England and in Liverpool as part of what we're trying to do with the Northern Powerhouse, which is bring together the scientific strengths and other strengths of these northern cities, which actually aren't too far away from each other geographically, uh, and uh, create a whole that is greater than the parts. So um, this, this commitment is also part of our bigger commitment to British science, even as has been said at a time when other budgets are, are feeling the strain. Take another question, but how was it when you had dengue? That must have been terrible. It was pretty awful, but I was a, um, I was around, I just, I was about 18 or 19 years old, so I was probably just about as fit as I was ever going to be <laughs> to tackle it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Osborne, um, welcome to Liverpool again. Uh, I'm Jeff Fitzgerald, Chief Executive City Council. I just wanted to follow up that latter point you were making about the impact of 
science on the Pro City region, perhaps on the Northern Powerhouse. Could you say a little bit more about what the fund and today's announcement means from that point of view? Yeah. Well, look, Liverpool has massive strength. So let, let, let's, you know, I will, you know, let's spare uh, Bill Gates's blushes. You know, Bill Gates can go anywhere in the world, right? He's one of the most successful people in, in our lifetimes. You know, he has chosen to come here. Uh, he's a smart guy who has chosen to invest in the brilliant work that you're doing in Liverpool. And, uh, you know, I think you should take that collectively as a massive endorsement of what you do. Uh, and uh, the, the Tropical Medical School, Medicine School itself employs, of course, lots of people in Liverpool. Uh, each job here, because they are good jobs uh, with uh, very smart people, creates other jobs in the city and I think also supports the brilliant universities you have here in Liverpool. So it kind of adds to the strengths of this city. And then what we're trying to do with the Northern Powerhouse is, is really this. You know, we have in Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, uh, Hull, Newcastle, you know, we have... We have strong cities with great strengths. They're not actually that far away from each other geographically. Put them together, uh, particularly these uh, cities you know, across the east, west of the north of England, here, Manchester, Leeds, and so on. Put them together geographically, fast, make the transport links faster, get the universities and the big teaching hospitals working more closely together, and you have uh, an agglomeration that can rival not just London, but uh, New York, the Boston area, other great you know, scientific and economic centers of our Western world. And that's what we're trying to do with the Northern Powerhouse and Liverpool and the work that you do here is an absolutely central part of it. Great, well I think you're going to have a little tour, aren't you, of some of the labs and see some of the excellent work being done here. So I'll hand back to you. Thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you for all the audience for coming as well. Um, we are going to take our um, guests on a, a short tour of the school. Um, other guests who are here are very welcome to go on the tour, but because we're going in a fairly small area as we go around, um, we're going to keep groups separate. So if you could wait here for a little while um, and then um, others who are hiding at the back there uh, will take you round. Um, but my thanks again, and I'm sure everybody appreciates the fact that Bill has come here along with uh, George Osborne to actually make this announcement today. And we are all delighted to see that. <laughs>